Hello, one and all, and welcome to episode 34 of Through the Years, the podcast that reviews Ring of Honor show by show from the beginning. As always, I'm Trevor Dame, and as always, he's Matt Feuerstein. Matt, this might be the most exciting episode for me personally that we've ever done, because before the show started, I took two cinnamon raisin bagels out of the freezer, and when the episode is done, I'll be able to eat them. Oh, I thought you were going to say you took something else before the show started. You can interpret that in all kinds of ways. Um, but, uh, I'm, you know, cinnamon bagels are good. I like them. Uh, I have a sandwich waiting for me when the show is over. I'm going to eat that sandwich and watch Game of Thrones. That's yes. what's going to happen. I also will watch Game of Thrones. This is the sacrifice we are making for you, the listener. We are recording this during the airing of that. Yeah, so. we, we're going to have to avoid... Twitter for a whole like hour after this podcast recording is over, which if you've uh, looked at either of our Twitters, you know that's pretty hard for us. So, <laughs> and We are missing it for this show. We are missing it for The Last Stand. But before we get into that, we should plug, as always, the great pro wrestling only podcast network of which we are members of. And Normally, I uh, I like to try and plug a ra- uh, not a random show, but one of the great shows. And this week, I was going to plug and will plug the Military Industrial Suplex, which is a great little um, not a little. It's a great mighty interview show where I think it's a lot more. It's one of the most intellectual wrestling podcasts I think I've ever heard of. It deals with maybe more social issues that you wouldn't expect in a wrestling podcast. And I, I don't know why my voice got high there, but uh, I really en- – it's, it's a really good show, and it's, it's something completely different on the network. So if for some reason you hate the, all the shows, including this one on the Pro Wrestling Only Network, other than that show, like I can understand <laughs> because it is so different – but Matt, the other show that's important to plug is you did another gang guest appearance. So you were on the Pro Wrestling Super Show once again after the Royal Rumble draft episode to do the WrestleMania draft episode. Another great performance from you, I should say. Wow. Well, thank you. I, um, I'm i going to assume based on that compliment that you didn't actually listen. So thank I you. I did. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, but uh, yes, this time I did not vote for my own uh, call, uh, my own lineup because I thought there was another that was better. Um, and I'm looking forward to the, uh, at least we've been talking about doing another one for SummerSlam. So I'm looking forward to that. We'll see if it, uh, it pans out, but I hope so. Cause those are fun shows to do. And I hope they are fun to listen to. I mean, I find them very fun and at, you know, at the risk of repeating what I said on the Royal Rumble one, it's a, it's always great to hear you podcast away from me because then I can actually sit down and listen to it again. Like <laughs> one of the only negatives of doing a podcast with you is it's like, Oh, I don't get to listen to podcasts with Matt anymore because I make them with Matt now. I've stolen him away from myself. But also, I I, like I said for the Royal Rumble one, I think it's a great this these draft shows are a great way to kind of do a retrospective of a of a a history of an event without doing like the usual. We're just going to go year by year through it, which you've also done with WrestleMania. Back before that, many, uh, many, many, many moons ago, (laughs) with Justin Shapiro and Joe Gagne on uh, Joe versus the World on www.thecupsfan.com. So back in 2007, literally, we were talking about an upcoming WrestleMania featuring non-politician, but still asshole Donald Trump. (laughs) Still (laughs) asshole. Uh Still, Um, but. Yeah, so great, lots of great stuff to listen to, but first you have to listen to this show. You have to. It's legally mandated. Uh. And we are covering The Last Stand. The Last Stand took place January 29th, 2004, at Michael's 8th Avenue in Glen Burnie, Maryland, in front of a reported crowd of 500 people. And this is another one of those strangely super appropriate show titles because this did turn out to be the last stand for Ring of Honor in this area for quite some time because, as we've mentioned before, due to the Rob Feinstein sex scandal, uh, they had their the their use of a they were using someone else's promoter's license for the area that got pulled. They were going to do the Shane Shamrock uh, Cup tournament. As a Ring of Honor show this year in 2004, they can't, they had to move that to Philly. So this really was the last stand in some ways. Yeah, and um, yeah, and maybe for the best. I'm not sure how I feel about this venue after this show, but I guess um, that might not be the venue's fault. 
Yeah, there, there's a lot of things going on with this show. And we start proper on the show, on the DVD, with an extremely poorly lit backstage area. Um, Gary Michael Capetta approaches Julia Smokes, and Gary is so upbeat and casual with Smokes that I wrote in my notes, this is already the greatest thing ever. I uh, may have been a little too excited, but uh, they shake hands. Smokes asks Gary what the dealio is. Gary then introduces Julius to the newest member of the Ring of Honor family, Sugar Sean Price, making his debut here as a new backstage interviewer in this segment. Um, Homicide's sitting in the background the whole time with a towel over his head. Gary asks Smokes and the cameraman, who is Gabe, if they're ready to shoot a promo, and they both say yes. So it's the usual Ring of Honor trope that they've used now. I Some, some 500-odd times probably of, oh, we're showing you what happens before the promo. And, uh, it's not going away anytime soon, just as a word of warning no. for anybody watching along with us. This Many more years of this <laughs> happening, so get ready. This is not even the first time well, – the last time we're going to see it on this show. So, uh, No, it's going to happen like it's a few minutes after this. <laughs> so um, yeah, Homicide's not in an upbeat mood. Homicide says today is the biggest match in his Ring of Honor career and needs some time for himself. He walks away and Gary asks Smokes what's going on. Smokes doesn't even know. And then Gary leaves Sugar Sean with Smokes and he hopes that Sugar can find get the scoop. This will be a little – this will be maybe the main event of the show, this yeah. show long storyline and what it builds to. I right. know we're both very excited for that. And, and, and along the way, um, Sean Price has – at least if in terms of Ring of Honor, maybe it's different in other promotions. He has a very unique way of referring to Julius Smokes because people call him either uh, J-Train or the Devil's Son-in-Law or just Julius Smokes. Or, but Sean, Sean Price calls him Julius T. Smokes, and he calls him that multiple times. At certain points, he actually says Julius T. And <laughs> I, um, I'm very curious if, if he's called that in any other context by any other person because – I feel like he must be, or else, like, why would why would Sean Price do that? That wouldn't make any sense if he just like made that up and stuck with it. But I found it entertaining. What? And also, I want to know if he actually knows Julius Smokes' last name. And if it is, now my curiosity has been piqued. What is Julius Smokes's? I mean, not last name, middle name. I'm going to go with Tiberius. I yeah. family was big Star Trek fans. Well, you know, if you just. Um, tag Julius Smokes in a tweet, he will either tell you or he'll promote some music that he's doing. Um, <laughs> yeah. One or the other, or both. And and rapidly. Like, if you yeah. ever want to get into contact with Julius Smokes, just mention him on Twitter, and within seconds he shows up <laughs> yes. with a link to his rap album. So, you know, it, it's he's very attentive in that way. Yeah, I, pre- I appreciate it, personally. Me too. And, uh, Matt, so like I said... Um, this was Sugar Sean Price's debut in Ring of Honor. He would stick around for quite a while. I just want to – going in the Wayback Machine, I found at the time – this is how Ring of Honor's website publicized the debut of uh, Sugar Sean Price. And note how like kind of at arm's length they are, they are pr- describing him. A new backstage interviewer will make his debut on the January 29th home release. He has no wrestling background, period. He will work with Gary Michael Capetta and offers a very different style than Capetta, period. That's it. (laughs) That's the way you introduce, like, a weird blind date that you're hooking up a friend with. Like, uh... I mean, he's certainly interesting. He, he he does things differently. He's he's definitely not like anyone else. Like, so, what was the date of this um, of this promotion that you know? Did you notice that? Because like, uh, I'm curious uh, if like this is like a, a, a Feinstein and Doug Gentry pick, and then like Gabe didn't want to promote him. Like, I, I, I don't know what that that's that's really weird. But I, I I don't know the timing, unfortunately. But what I do, I just I can't get over the fact that the one complete sense here is just. He has no wrestling background. <laughs> period. period. Like, <laughs> which begs the question: Why is he here? Like, what? Like, what does he bring to the table? It's just, it's a very weird way to hype someone. There's no, there are no compliments in that paragraph. Right, and it's not like they got rid of him right away either. It's not like they were like, well, this guy sucks, so let's just, ex- you know, make an excuse and get rid of it. That he stuck around, like you said. Um, so. Uh, I don't know. Was it like? Was it a favor to somebody? Like, was it somebody's like cousin? Like, I don't. I don't know what's going on here. Especially because Gary Michael Capetta is still there. 
Like, they already have, like, like, Ring of Honor is not a company so big that they need two backstage interviewers, I would imagine, I would think. And they're not, <laughs> excuse me, they're not, over the years, a lot of very memorable Sugar Sean Price moments, you know what I mean? Yeah. Although we may have discovered one tonight, although he's kind of on the periphery of it, but... Yes, a, this this a, is the most memorable Sugar Sean Price moment <laughs> on his very debut show. I agree with that. We'll get to it later. I can't wait. <laughs> um, next, we have a segment of Samoa Joe's ring, still with the most horrible font choice for the on-screen graphic. Joe says he has better things to do tonight than demonstrate a technique, which is what he would normally do on Samoa Joe's ring. He says Jim Cornette is making his return to Ring of Honor tonight for the Briscoes match against Joe and Jerry Lynn. And then Joe goes on to say at main event, at main event spectacles, he crippled Cornette backstage. And then he, Joe goes on to say he stretched Cornette so bad he couldn't find the building in Ohio or maybe he was afraid to, which was a nice little way to play up that real life occurrence of Cornette not making it to the Ohio show. Uh, stressed Joe him, stressed him so bad that two and a half months later he could not find his way to a, <laughs> to an event. It gave him a three month phobia of MapQuest. Um, right. Joe demonstrates a submission on a student that he claims he did to Cornette backstage that we didn't see because that was off camera. Joe says he's defended the Ring of Honor title thirteen times and will leave tonight as a double champ. And this is just basically another good, solid Joe promo. Like, they're never epic, but that's kind of one of the reasons why I think they're good is some guys, definitely you see in Ring of Honor in the early stages, they take a little bit of too much free license to go on and on and on. Joes are usually, like, to the point. They never overstay their welcome. Right. Um, it's – and, like, but they can't reach – like, you're never going to reach great heights in a promo if you're cutting a promo on the manager that you're never you – know, you know, it's like – the guy you're going to beat the crap out of, that's the guy you're going to cut the real epic promo on. Yeah. Um, this is just sort of like, you know, um, Cornette's on the periphery of these storylines. He's he's a guest star. He's not the main event, um, pun intended. Yeah. And then we transition elsewhere backstage to Alice in Danger trying to stop an argument between Dan Moff and BJ Whitmer. Moff thinks ever since BJ has joined uh, the prophecy that things have fallen apart. Danger says the injured Christopher Daniels left her a plan. And then she goes on to say one of the two of them needs to win the number one contendership four way tonight. I wrote in my notes. What a plan. Like <laughs> what a what a crazy out of the box plan. Well, also, uh, um, Moff says that like he they have three objectives, but he never says what they are. It's like <laughs> it's and and Whitmer like during the quote main part of the promo doesn't speak at all. He just kind of like nods at the camera. Um, <laughs> so all in all, they seem to have their shit together. And, and as we just mentioned a minute ago. Uh, Gabe from behind the camera does the old it's time to start the promo bit. So like the second time in under 10 minutes and uh, apparently the prophecy never watched the DVD releases of their shows because they've done this to the prophecy like 18 times where <laughs> they're fighting, they're strife in the group and then they start the promo and they don't and then they act like nothing's wrong. But apparently no one has ever clued them in that. Hey, like <laughs> this is all on camera. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so we get the official promo at this point with Danger saying that the prophecy will get even with the, with Daniel's hurt. Um, Moff says the prophecy is now full of hate because of Daniel's injury. And he says the prophecy, as Matt said, has three objectives. He doesn't say what the three objectives are, like Matt mentioned. We then hear a cut, but of course the camera keeps rolling afterwards as well. And that's when Whitmer finally speaks. <laughs> BJ thinks the focus tonight should be on making sure he wins the number one contendership, saying that he got closer to beating Joe in 2003 than Moff did. Moff is not happy. Yeah, but, but he also says he got closer to beating Joe with a broken nose than Moff did when Moff was healthy. Now, longtime listeners will recall that Moff, while his nose might have been healthy, was wrestling mere hours after his father had died. So that seems extra insensitive to me. <laughs> and I don't. I wonder if that's like real insensitive. Like I wonder if Whitmer in the moment forgot that, or if that was like a purposeful thing. I hope it was purpose. I mean, I don't know if I hope it was purposeful actually, but <laughs> it, I mean, at least it would have been smarter if it was purposeful. 
So, yeah, this is like Moff and Whitmer and Danger are all over the show, basically doing the same one note thing, which is they're kind of working together, kind of feuding. Danger's trying to hold them together, blah, blah, blah. It It's a little tiring already at this point, and we're going to see this stick quite a bit more tonight. So uh, next up we have – Something that did not make the DVD, we have a. I went back and found a PW Insider report from Joe Mistretta, who where he wrote the SAT and Kenan Creed beat Chad and Dino and Slugger. For those who don't know, Chad and Dino's gimmick is that they dress and act like Jay and Silent Bob. They are locals who were really over with the crowd. It was an okay opener. The SAT, SATs looked good getting the pin with the Spanish fly. Well, there must have been something wrong with it because this DVD had a lot of time left on the end, and they did not put this match on it. So, Yeah, that, that's a great point for those who aren't following along, and I can't blame you with this one. It's Usually Ring of Honor DVDs are right around the three-hour mark, you know, unless they're a double DVD event. Right. This one was 2.38, and it felt like they were stretching to get there. You're right. So, like, on um, – so they, they clearly had a hard limit at three hours. I, on, I don't know if it's because for VHS purposes or DVD purposes at the time, but they could never go over the three hours unless they, like, with um, – with Death Before Dishonor, they made it into two DVDs. So uh, at the previous show, the battle lines are drawn. They went right up to the edge, and they are clearly the show was so packed they had to cut out every single entrance. They didn't show any of the entrances, no music or anything. They just – the guys were in the ring. They had the match, and they still went to the end. On this show, they showed every second of every single entrance, no matter how unimportant the match was. And they still had 20 minutes left to spare at the end of the DVD. So they were really stretching for time here. And clearly this match was not good enough to uh, help them stretch that time out. Yeah, it's, it's weird because the other show, uh, I think a final battle, the pre-show, I said, oh, that's the final SAT match in Ring of Honor. It didn't even make the main show. I uh, I didn't even realize or remember that this they had this match here. So I never knew about it. So y- Yeah, I might have not known either. So like – Really, kind of going out with a whimper, the SAT, the last couple matches in Ring of Honor, and not even, yeah, yeah, again, not even being considered like good enough to appear on a show that ran probably 22 minutes short. Uh, Like, there are a couple matches on this show where, like, the post match, the camera just lingers on the wrestlers in the ring and walking to the back for, like, no point but to stretch the time out. Like, nothing happens. And there's just, like, an extra 20 seconds of here's a guy kind of walking around the ring and then walking to the back just because they need to fill the time to make this, like, a decent length. So... But and clearly that that random uh, aimless walking was more entertaining than this match that they did not air. <laughs> or there was something wrong with the cameras and they couldn't actually air it. That's the only other explanation I have. They, they were worried they were going to get sued by uh, Kevin Smith for the Jay and Silent Bob infringing gimmick, apparently. That's uh, exactly it. Next, we get to the opener of what we get to see on the home release. A three rope break rule match, not a pure rules match, a three rope break rule match. John Walters defeats Chad Collier in 14 minutes, 10 seconds, when he made him submit to some kind of, I would guess, like a tarantula, Boston Crab type guy caught in the rope submission thing that he could only do because Collier had exhausted his three rope breaks. Matt, what did you think about this, the second ever match in Ring of Honor to have the three rope break rule? I, I was very happy to see Collier back because um, he his showings in, the, in early 2003 were – I thought across the board very good, um, and I thought he was good here. I thought Walters was good here. You know, this is the sort of stuff that maybe people don't have much patience for now. Um, the crowd was very into it, though. I thought, um, you know, because I was about to say because it's the opener, they have a lot of uh, you know advantage. But apparently, it was not the opener. Um, but the crowd still had that like early match energy, and the wrestling was solid. You know, they 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 did the stuff where. Um, both guys use their rope breaks, you know, too early. You know, they're getting used to it. You know, um, Walter uses his, Walter uses his first one, just getting out of like a standing arm ringer, and Collier uses his to escape, just like a basic leg hold that Walters hadn't even locked in yet. Um, so there's that whole learning curve stuff, which I think if you're going to try to get this over, um, you know, I think that's probably pretty smart. Um, Chris Nelson is back on commentary with uh, with Chris Lovey, aka Gabe. And again, I would say the same thing as I said last time. He's 
unmemorable, and that's not necessarily bad. Um, he loves talking about wrestlers not hooking the leg. That's one thing he kept going back to in his criticisms, which is a thing that CM Punk also, when he's on commentary during this era, stresses a lot. You got to hook the leg, guys. Um, oh, were you going to say he something? Might, he might have picked that up from uh, Dave Prezak when they worked together in IWE Mid-South, CM Punk might have, because d- that was practically a catchphrase for Dave Pre- Prezak to go, you've got to hook the leg, man. He would always say that over and over again. I don't know how much he did that in Ring of Honor, though. I, I don't remember him doing it much in Ring of Honor. But, yeah, I mean, he definitely that makes sense that that could have been like a, he could have been a trendsetter in the indie uh, commentary world. Um also during this match, it's the first time that the announcers mention that Samoa Joe is not happy with the advent of the pure title. That's sort of a um, that's sort of going to be a thing going forward, and this is the first time you really hear about that. That Samoa Joe is not really into into this idea of having this second title that's competing for prestige with his title. But you know they they trade the you know the reversals and like suplexes and Walters at one point like smoothly he goes from like a cross a crossbow move into a surfboard uh, slash rear chin lock, which I thought was pretty cool. You know, I think he, he's, you know, his, his kind of his um, submission transitions are pretty good. Um, overall, I, um, you know, I thought this was good. Like it was just a good, solid, unmemorable match. The work was fine. Um, you know, nothing, nothing to complain about, nothing to really remember either. This was one of those matches I had a hard time, like in my, when I was writing up my notes. Like, even at, and I write my notes generally right after I watch each match and segment. I'll pause and I'll go and write my notes so it's really fresh in my head. And I was having a hard time, like, writing things about this match right after it happened because it is just so, like, there's nothing wrong with it. It is just a very average basic match this is like what i I milk milk toast is a word that i would use for this match i was about to say rice cake so i like that we both went to like (laughs) food references but like there's nothing wrong with a rice cake if someone hands you one you have to eat it you're not gonna go ew but it's not it's just it's just it's 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 calories this match was calories yeah if, if you're gonna set a bar for just like a wrestling match that doesn't really mean much but you know, you wanted to have some solid workmanship and entertainment. I think this is a fine bar to set. Like this is like if this is if this is your average wrestling match, then you're probably doing okay. They did kind of the one one thing I will say is they they didn't work this like other than the free rope break. This match stylistically isn't much different than any other Ring of Honor undercard match. Like they do work a bit on the mat, but they kind of do a bit of everything in this match. So it's it's kind of a it's a very standard indie match stylistically, I would say, for this era and this promotion, just with the three rope break rule and it paying off with Collier using them all up and then getting trapped in a submission that would normally be illegal because it's in the ropes, but he's used them up. But there's it, it uh, to me, this is almost like that Mendoza line match where if it's it's better than this match, it's a it's a good match. If it's worse than this match, it's a bad match because it's so right in the middle. I was actually more interested with a couple of things that weren't related to the match, really. The first thing we have to mention, and it's something I forgot to mention about the last show, but it's even more true of this one. The lighting for these last two shows is maybe the worst I've ever seen. With the, Honor. This one is just beyond the pale. Like It's to the point where like the hard camera, not great. But then the handheld ringside camera, like sometimes you cannot even see. Like It's just like darkness. And the white balance is so completely off. Like the the lighting for the hard camera is fine if if everything was consistent. But whenever you go to like a handheld camera, everything is is like dark, like you said, and has kind of a greenish, sickly matrix style tint to it. And a lot of the backstage segments are poorly lit in this venue. It, it, it's it's some of the worst. Like. Honestly, lighting I have ever seen. Uh, I've seen much smaller indie shows with much better lighting than this. And it's weird because if you watch shows from like the spring of 2003, like clearly there's a massive leap forward in production and things look so much better. And in the past few shows, they've just looked like way worse. Like, and I, I don't know like what the, what's what's going on. Like, but like always the backstage stuff. They didn't do a great job with the white balance and stuff. But the actual like in arena stuff looked pretty good um, in, in like from like let's say uh, May through August 
of 2003. And then just – they just got so lazy. I don't know what happened. I can't even imagine. Did somebody who knew what they were doing leave? Yeah, it's so weird because like you said, it's not like this was always the case up to this point. It's it's, it's not like, oh, they haven't figured something out. It's like they've taken a step back for these shows. Several steps back. Yeah, yeah like they've forgotten something or someone new had to come in. Like it's just – but you would think at this point the same people will be running production and shooting it. I just I, – I don't know what happened, but it it, it is very it, – it, it hurt my enjoyment of the show a little bit, honestly. And this show didn't need anyone – anything dinging it already because it needed all the help it could get. I th- I th- I'd say it hurt my enjoyment of the show a lot in the sense of some of these camera shots, like literally – it was they were like – pitch black except for like the glare from like the lighting like that that's and that was it it's it was so weird um the only other thing i'll mention from this is when uh gabe introduced chris nelson for this his second and i and my believe final appearance as a commentator in ring of honor he introduced him as a veteran of the ring wars which i assume happened right after vietnam i i just like that, that kind of over like, the ring war the ring wars took place in middle earth <laughs> Obviously, so the Ring Wars—that's what's happening on Game of Thrones tonight. That's right. There's you know Mordor Actually, and yeah. Gondor, and <laughs> that, that's where the Ring Wars happened. And like you said, like Chris Nelson, he's he's forgettable, but not in a bad w- way. Like we've heard a lot worse. We've heard better. He he's he's easily ignorable, which maybe in a world where there's a ton of great commentary wouldn't be a compliment but in in the world we live in today and in the world of ring of honor commentary up to this point you could do a lot worse than easily ignorable so yeah i mean just wrestling commentary in general has not been very good maybe ever but definitely not in the past 20 years so chris nelson you are not even close to the worst congratulations <laughs> Uh, that's that's the kind of award I strive to win one day about yeah. anything, Matt. I don't. But, me too, man. <laughs> so after the match, Gabe says his producer just told him in his earpiece that they have a Christopher Daniels promo and they're cutting to it right now. And to show you how long they have to drag things out, instead of immediately cutting to it, we see another like 20 seconds of Walters and Collier just standing around in the post-match of their match. And then we finally do cut to Daniels sitting somewhere, a baby on his shoulder... It's, uh, I guess, sitting in his house, we, I assume. He holds a finger to his lips to let us know to be quiet because the baby's trying to sleep. Speaking and of he, bad production. <laughs> and he uh, rubs his baby's back as he cuts a very quiet, different kind of promo. He says rather than debuting in Baltimore, he's at home recovering from the injury he suffered at the last show when Punk took him out while the, all the Second City Saints, they put him through the table with the Pepsi Plunge. Daniel says he blames himself rather than CM Punk because he underestimated Punk. Daniel says that the more time he spends with his baby daughter, the more time the more he realizes what a petulant child Punk is. He says the prophecy have a clear agenda, and I, I like this Matt. He says that we they have a better than average chance of making it happen, which I thought is strangely modest for a guy who's supposed to be like the evil leader of a heel wrestling faction. Like like not we'll definitely win, but we have a better than average chance of making it happen. Uh, Daniels then goes on to say that BJ or Dan Moff will become the number one contender tonight, and then he ends by saying when he returns. Punk will see a side of Christopher Daniels that his daughter will never see, that Punk will wish he never saw. He gives his daughter a kiss. And I will say watching this promo, I think we talked on a different uh, – maybe on the last show even that I found a shoot interview Christopher Daniels said where he he was talking about he really wished he had gotten to do the Punk feud. But obviously he got pulled off because of the Feinstein scandal because he thought Punk would inspire him to like up his promo game and like go on a deeper – do deeper promos. And definitely here, you can see Daniels is trying something different. Yeah, but I was distracted during this promo because I thought the production on this was, like, beyond bad. Um, there was, like, this background noise that was, like, there the whole time to make that made me wonder, like, what the hell was this guy filming this on? Like, like cameras that were, like, like the earliest sound cameras in history or something like that. Like, that's how bad the production on this was, or the sound quality at the very least. And I found it very distracting. Um, I thought that calling Punk a petulant child was a sick burn when you're holding a baby in your hand. But um, other than that, yeah, I, I thought I, the production I found more noticeable than the promo itself. 
I, I like the promo. I didn't think it was absolutely amazing, but I appreciate that he was going for something different. And it is kind of a, a classic trope of promos that occasionally you see where you, when someone expects you to go really loud and angry, you instead go really calm and quiet. You know, you would expect after being taken out by Punk, his first promo after would be like screaming, I'm going to get revenge. And instead he's trying to do that very like collected – you know, I am going to hurt you bad, but I'm not going to raise my voice. I'm going to be quiet. I'm like, Here's my daughter next to me. That juxtaposition of I can be a really tender family man and also someone that's going to apparently like raise holy hell on you. I – see, my critique of this is more like his injury thing was huge and it was at the end of the previous DVD. I think to sell it, you know, they kept him off the live shows for a while, you know, like two straight live shows, which is a couple of months in between the show that had happened and the show where he was supposed to come back. They should have kept him off at least one DVD. Um, yeah, and he, and he didn't like – not that you necessarily have to look hurt to be hurt, but he didn't have any noticeable injuries. He didn't – like there wasn't anything here to sell that he was still hurt other than him saying – that he couldn't make the show. Right. Like keep him off and then like have him – if you're going to have him come back on a promo before his actual like live return, have it be at the end of a DVD and have it almost feel like a surprise. Like, oh, he yeah. lives and he has something to say, you know, as opposed to like just, oh, mundane. Here I am. Yeah, I'm fine. I'll, I'll be back and I'm going to be mad. You know, I like the, the delivery of the promo was good, but I thought the idea of the promo was kind of flawed. I just realized that the the girl, the, the little Daniel's daughter, she must be like 15 or 16 now, and that makes me feel old, so I'm changing my mind. That is the worst promo I've ever seen because it reminds me how old I am. So Every, that, pro- every promo reminds me how old I am. So, <laughs> Well, Daniel's normally wouldn't because he's ageless, so you can watch any Daniel's promo and go, man, maybe if I'm lucky and my genes go the right way. If everything breaks right, I'll be as timeless as Daniel's. But That's true. I mean I'm definitely – Older by a few years than Daniels was in, when he cut that promo. So, okay, that makes me feel old. My <laughs> God, my God. Uh, well, God, think about how much older we are than all the other wrestlers on these shows. Uh, well, this, this is the last episode of Through the Years. No more. <laughs> this is the last stand. Um, that brings us to the next match, though, which is a first for Ring of Honor: a six-man mayhem match where Chris Sabin defeated Caprice Coleman. Hydro, Jack Evans, Slick Wagner Brown, and Sanjay Dutt in 938 when Sabin pins Hydro after hitting a cradle shock. So for those wondering what a six-man mayhem match is, it's basically a scramble but with six guys instead of a bunch of tag teams. So um, I really enjoyed this. I thought this was like a – for a short match, like I thought this was just a flat-out like good spot fest. And in some ways, it, it's kind of – you know, just like a scramble, but I think there's two things that really do it different, that make it more entertaining for me than some of the recent scrambles we've seen. The first is just a lot of these guys were are people we haven't seen much of in Ring of Honor yet, like Sanjay Dutt, Caprice Coleman, Jack Evans. They're all guys that have very limited experience of Ring of Honor so far. So it just it's novel to see like, oh, w- new guys, you know, these are spots we haven't seen much of yet. And the second thing I thought that made it like more refreshing is that a lot of four ways and scrambles, they always do the same format and the same tropes. In fact, we'll see examples of that later. But one of the tropes is like they'll try and do a straight up wrestling match for the first two or three minutes and then it'll break down into a more crazy spot fest. So you'll have people respecting the tags and doing some more a little bit slower pace wrestling and then after two or three minutes it breaks down. What I like about this match is it knows exactly what it is. Like right from the start, it it, it it skips that first two or three minutes. It's just big guys trying to do big spots and entertain and, you know, everyone going in and out basically the whole nine and a half minutes. So it's not trying to be anything but what it is. And yeah, it, it's just – it's not like an amazing you have to go out of your way to see it match, but it's probably the most I've enjoyed one of these like sub 10 minute spot fests in a while for ring of honor. Um, I didn't feel as positively about it as you did. Um, I, uh, I appreciated the work. You know, I liked seeing Jack Evans, like the real Jack Evans for the first time in ROH because he was at uh, main event spectacles and he certainly made it a, a memorable showing with some of his moves, but his personality didn't show through at all in that match. And from the moment he went through the curtain here, he was like the Jack Evans we know, like doing breakdancing. You know, he, he said to Hydro, he was like, 
shake the fucking hand right at the beginning. You know, he was he was being Jack Evans. Um, I also thought that Sanjay Dutt and Caprice Coleman really stood out. You know, Caprice just uh, he had just really good body control. Like he's like a springboard spin kick that was really cool. Sanjay Dutt's dives are really awesome. Um, but there, you know, there were some spots that I just don't get into in these matches. The moves, the mat, the one where everyone does a submission on everyone else. I never like those. They just, they just, I don't know. They, they it loses me whenever I see that. And then there was also a spot where like everyone like suplexed everyone else, and a bunch of guys went over and like, but I couldn't tell who was suplexing and who was being suplexed, and. That was kind of that kind of took me out of it, but it was fun. I'd say like the high spot of the match was when um, Sanjay Dutt. Well, first of all, he did a muscle buster on Jack Evans, which makes this the second show in a row that someone does a muscle buster in the second match, and it is not Samoa Joe. Because <laughs> um, last last show, I think it was uh, what Cody Hawk did it to Nigel yeah, McGuinness. Yeah. And and then he does the Hindu press on Jack Evans, but Brown breaks it up. And I thought after that, it just kind of fell off a little bit. Like like Brown tried to slam off the top rope, but he couldn't get his footing, so he just did it off the uh, off the canvas. Um, and I don't know. I just it just felt like a lot of momentum was lost. And then finally, Saban beat Hydro with the uh, with the cradle shock. But um, I don't know. I just didn't think it held together. There were definitely cool spots. I agree with that for sure. It wasn't bad. But it didn't leave a strong positive impression on me either. I, I did. I do agree that it did kind of slow down. Like at the end, when I think when more guys were selling, it kind of slowed a bit. And there was one really awkward spot. Now that I think of it and look over my notes, where um, let me just see if I can find it. There was a spot where I believe Slick Wagner Brown was going to do like a top rope spot or something to somebody, and Caprice Coleman is just standing in the ring, and clearly someone's supposed to be tying him up or something. And but no one is. So he's just standing in the ring watching Slick Wagner Brown like do the spot to somebody else. And even the announcers have to acknowledge like even if Brown hits this, it's not going to matter because Caprice Coleman's going to break it up. And that's exactly what happens. Like so it was clearly just someone was a little bit off there. But yeah, other I, I, I just yeah, I thought it was fun. But the other thing is a couple other things I noticed first was uh I think this is going to be the picture for the show. Hydro and Becky Bayless before the start of the match meet the most amazing fan at ringside who is a middle-aged man in a denim jacket with this insanely long flowing hair and a mustache. And they really are enamored with him. And he just, he's an amazing looking person, just amazing. And I almost feel bad, um, uh, praising him because the last time I point out like a uh, like a really weird like wild looking fan it was the special it was the ring crew express fan that was at a couple shows and that guy turned out to be a plant so I hope this guy is not a plant well actually I hope he is a plant because that would be very funny in a weird way yeah let him be a plant hey (laughs) um the other thing that they really go into on this show is they overhype a bunch of things on the show and one of the things is they say whoever wins this match gets a spot in the top five rankings. And I don't know if it's this match or another match, but I think like Chris Nelson actually says something like, um, if you get in the top five rankings and ring of honor, you're known all over the world and it, it, how important this is. So let's just say it like Chris Saban wins this match. He loses his next match on the next show, which is the first round tournament match in the pure title tournament. He loses to Doug Williams in eight minutes. So it, it, it's it's just weird when you build up how important the top five rankings is. It, it never really seems that important. Well, I, right, I just, I'm, and also you know it's the whole thing of like guys skyrocketing up, skyrocketing up the card if they win the field of honor, then Matt Striker's in the exact same position or lower. John Walters, you know, he wins his big feud with Xavier's was pushed for most of the last half of 2003. Back in the opening match on this show, you know, it's like there's not a lot. There's a lot of times they have a hard time showing that somebody has steady upward momentum it's like they want these guys to to get over but when they don't when they're not over when they're not ready ready yet for spots high up on the card in the drawing matches they don't book them in those places which is is a good thing but at the same time they book them in these matches where they tell you they're going to become main eventers and then it's like when they book the next card they go well matt striker can't draw in the main event 
but then don't tell us that him winning these matches is going to make him a main eventer. Don't tell us someone getting in the top five is going to like shoot them straight to the top and completely change their career in this promotion unless you can really feel confident that you can guarantee that. Right. Like I just I, – they're, they're getting a little too excited about that. It's weird because like they should know. Like the thing that makes you a main eventer in ROH at this point is – a, if you have, you know, massive charisma like in any wrestling promotion, or that your ability to have really over the top, memorably great matches, right? Yeah. And um, these guys that they're trying to push haven't had, I don't, haven't do either of those things, you know? So, like, wait till you find a guy that does that and then tell us that he's a surefire main eventer, or just show us, like with Paul London. Yeah, like wait until someone's over, then let them win like the number one contendership or the top five rankings or whatever tournament. And then, you know, wait until you're already sure that they can handle the spot and then push them into that spot and you won't have to have second thoughts about it. Right. But uh, next up, we get the very first good times, great memories that takes place in the ring in front of the fans rather than just taped backstage for a DVD release, which I have to assume is another sign of how they even realized at the time that this show needed a lot of help getting even to like a decent run time because it doesn't seem that essential, but some fans applaud Colt as he comes out, some boo, a couple even flip him off. Colt tries to do a like late night uh, talk show style monologue with material like, what's the deal with baby faces? I mean, are they babies? And then uh, Colt then heals on the crowd for not appreciating him and he gets a loud you suck chant in response. Colt mocks a fan in the front row for wearing sunglasses, saying that there's only two kinds of people that wear sunglasses indoors, blind people and assholes. Colt then introduces his guests, which are the Ring Crew Express, Don and Marcos. Well, of course, he, yeah, you left out a couple of his uh, great uh, monologue bits like, ever notice that there's always white people on the news? I mean, <laughs> don't you hate white people? And, you know, I mean, guy has a point. <laughs> but, but um, yeah, I mean, he was doing real edgy material. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, and I, I mean, I do hate myself, so that that bit's very relatable. That right. works in my that works in my quadrant of the demographic, as I'm, they would say. I'm here with you, buddy. <laughs> uh, Dunn and Marcos do their catchphrases. Colt says Dunn and Marcos aren't even a good team, giving lots of examples of great teams, including Bert and Ernie and the Ghostbusters. Um, Colt starts ranting seriously at Dunn and Marcos for them thinking they're good until Marcos grabs the mic back and vents how they haven't gotten anywhere yet. He announces the start of the Dunn and Marcos We're Not Gonna Take It 2004 tour. At this point, BJ Whitmer and Dan Moff run in. They attack Colt, but Dunn and Marcos come to his defense, playing air guitar as We're Not Gonna Take It plays over the PA. Very shortly after that, BJ and Moff murder them with the Burning Hammer and Exploder 98. And they pose with Alice in danger. Um, with this segment, again, it felt – I realize it's kind of trying to further the uh, the Prophecy Second City Saints feud. And Colt has a lot of charisma. But again, this segment to me felt like just them desperately trying to stretch out the show. And it's also weird because Colt is playing heel and getting some booze while also doing this kind of crowd-pleasing comedy that the fans want to laugh at. So it's another one of these Ring of Honor mixed messages where – if you want Colt to be a heel, don't have him like do goofy comedy that will make the crowd laugh. Even just the fact that like he's healing on Dunn and Marcos, who are like fan favorite, like goofy novelty act. But then after he heals on them, they come to his defense. Like it's, it's just uh, you you don't know what he's supposed to be. Uh, everything you said is probably true, but this is one of my favorite things on the whole show. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> I liked it a lot. I really did. I thought Colt was funny. I like that this is this is actually so this whole thing with Don and Marcos like you might not remember but this is like the beginning of like an ongoing thing. They said they said they're kicking off their we're not going to take it anymore 2004 tour and they this goes on for a while like almost the entire year I think where they 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 fight back and we're not going to take it plays and then they eventually get the shit kicked out of them again. But <laughs> I think it's funny. I think it's I think Don and Marcos are lovable and charismatic in their way. Um you know, I thought of all the things involving the prophecy tonight, this was the least annoying. Um, and, it, you know, it did build an angle. And I don't know. I just thought it was very entertaining. If there's anyone in Ring of Honor that's more that we've seen up to this point in their history that has always been more consistently over than their push so far, it's Colt Cabana. Like I thought you were always... going to I thought you were going to say the Ring Crew Express. <laughs> no, actually, actually, 
God damn it. There, there was a better example right in, yeah, right in the same segment. But no, I, I guess I almost don't think of them as wrestlers, which is offensive because yeah. I actually like Dun & Marcos. But I feel like Colt Cabana always gets like a really good reaction in, in his matches, in his promos. And while he does get now like pretty much mic time on every show with his set, with Good Times, Great Memories, he's still just a mid-card guy. And it feels like in Ring of Honor at this point, there aren't many guys that don't get pushed to their level of of like um, popularity. He's one of the only guys where I feel like the crowd would be re- would be into him doing more than what he does, which right now is kind of like a spare part for the Second City Saints. Yeah, I mean, like, I mean, if they had just given him the whole Field of Honor push instead of Matt Stryker, I think it would have made a lot of sense. He was very charismatic, and I think probably better wrestler than that striker. He, like, he was the most over guy in that tournament, and I don't think it was close. Yeah, and no, I mean, I should say he's, he's not probably a better wrestler. He definitely was a better wrestler than Matt Stryker, probably by a lot. Um, you know, he was a really good worker, and you know, was for many years after too. So, yeah, he should have been in the main event mix at this point. If he had won the Field of Honor and they went with him, like he, he would have been a major player. I mean, he still was obviously a major player, but never got to the level that he could have gotten to as a singles wrestler. And this is also the point in the show where I saw former through the years guest Joe Sposto sitting in an aisle seat. So nice. another appearance of Joe, I got, I, I then got distracted looking at hit at whenever I could see him and go, Oh, what's Joe going to react to this appearance? But Joe, Joe, you are an extremely distracting person. Whenever you appear <laughs> on screen, we just can't help but stare and stare at you. The magnetism, the animal sexuality that Joe Sposto has. I just cannot break away from it, Matt. I'm not speaking for you. I know. I'm just saying. Uh, <laughs> next we join Sugar Sean Price, or as he says, the S to the S to the P backstage. Sean says, Homicide and Julius T. Smokes, I wrote, what is Scoop? Because like he must, like you said before, he must know his middle name. Uh-huh. Have been in a locker room for 20 minutes. He says that they've been in a locker room for 20 minutes without a sound. Like 20 minutes is apparently... A long time to be silent in a locker room. I don't know. I feel like I could be silent in a locker room for 20 minutes quite easily. But um, Prove it. <laughs> next 20 minutes, just moments of silence. Mm-hmm. Uh, Price says that, uh, they, that they've closed the door to the media, which I, I imagine the media at this point consists of Gary Michael Capetta and Sugar Sean Price. And, and quote-unquote – Cameraman, <laughs> aka Dave Sapolsky. Yeah. Uh, Sean Price says he's going to wait until they come out so he can give us fans the four one one. He closes by saying, "Holla back." He never really does quite get the four one one. At least before, the, like, w- eventually they have to come out of the locker room. We don't see um, any re- resolution to this to the very end of the show after the entire show has been completed. So, but what? But what a resol- What a resolution. <laughs> I just I'm just so, gonna keep teasing this all night. I'm very excited. <laughs> Next up, we have a no disqualification three way tag team match. The backseat boys defeated Special K of Dixie and Izzy and the Carnage crew of Just Incredible and Loke in six minutes twenty seconds when Cashmere pinned Loke after a T gimmick. Uh, Devito wasn't here. Gabe's excuse for I, I imagine it was probably something related to like his real job or something. Uh, Gabe's excuse on commentary, I believe, was something to the effect of Devito's at home look, making sh- like watching his daughter. So. <laughs> Like to, I guess, to make sure that no one roofies her in their house. Just to make sure she doesn't go down to Baltimore. (laughs) I can't blame him there. Yeah, that's for Baltimore Baltimore listeners. I've just watched The Wire. I have bad misconceptions. Baltimore uh, is a lovely city. I have been there fairly recently. Seems like it has good food. But Hmm. Matt, was this match as good as the food in Baltimore, or just in the city of Baltimore? I mean, probably as good as some of the food in Baltimore, but not other food in Baltimore. (laughs) Um, um, this match, um, it wasn't much of a match, but it was wild, you know, like it was, uh, it was entertaining for what it was. I enjoyed that since this was a no DQ match, Johnny Cashmere was wearing a red baseball cap and HC Loke was wearing a beanie. So they were basically wearing their, uh, brawling hats. Uh, <laughs> but, um, this probably was most notable for the uh this this uh edition of violence against women um they um so they had the three quote unquote not my words special case sluts this is what they call them in this case i don't think becky bayless was with them right it was just three random women 
I and think so. The three women that we had not seen before. And so at one point, Loke, Just Incredible, and Trent Acid all forcibly kiss the three different members of the uh, special case sluts all at the same time, literally like force kiss them and then throw them off the apron, which is, um, you know, as always really fucking uncomfortable. And then afterwards you, they, you cut to them and they're like smiling, like, like who they secretly liked it, but they were clearly like force kisses. So that's, you know, bad. Um, and the announcers say that, um, one of the special case sluts quote looks 12, which in case you wanted to make this much more uncomfortable. Um, so besides that, the uh, wrestling or brawling parts of the match, I mean, it was short. It was like fast paced. Um, like, um, so like Litz there and he's getting beaten up. I'm still unclear. So like who were like some of these special K matches? It annoys me when I'm not sure who the guys in the match were. Like, were they all of them technically in the match? I don't know. At first I thought it was Izzy and Angel Dust, but then Lit was also there. Um, was and Dixie was there, right? So, um, like at one point there's like a spike that's incredible on Dixie. Um, and then Special K pulls Justin out, and the back seats hit the T gimmick on Loke, and they get the win. So was Dixie part of the match, or wasn't he? I don't know. But I do know that at the end, um, Trent goes to uh, the Carnage crew, who's stupid now, us or you? And, I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know how this match answered that question. Um, <laughs> but uh, it was fine for what it was. Um, it wasn't good, and there were some really uncomfortable parts. Um but it wasn't it wasn't bad, I don't think, at all. This match really annoyed me. I actually I don't know if it was bad, but I, I didn't enjoy it because it was short, but there's one reason I really didn't enjoy it, which is this is supposed to be a three way tag match for most of and it's no DQ, but like you alluded to, most of the match it's more actually it feels more like an eight man tag because the illegal members of Special K are taking as much of a beating as the legal members. Who are the Who are the legal members though? Like, uh, did, were you clear on this? Um, Cage Match says Dixie and Izzy. I think all the websites say Dixie and Izzy. I see. I thought it was Izzy and Angel Dust at the beginning. Oh wait, let me let me just double check. I might even read my thing wrong. Let me just. No, no. I think. I mean, I'm no, sure Dixie you're right. And Izzy, it's, yeah, I'm sure I, you're I, right, but it was confusing. I mean, that's 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 so that's one thing, but that's not a big deal. But the thing that that bothered me was one of the tropes in wrestling I hate is when there's a multi-man match and the announcers or people act like that two members are supposed to work together or like it's sacrilege when one attacks the other. And so in this match, the backseats and Carnage crew do not attack each other till the very end of the match. The, the, the whole match, they're just focused on beating the crap out of Special K. And then right at the very end, um, there's that spike... Uh, the 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 spike that's incredible and then the backseat boys are just waiting for for that to happen and then they hit the t gimmick on a on one of the carnage crew guys and win the match and the announcing the announcers act like and, and the carnage crew act like the backseats have double crossed the carnage crew it wasn't an eight-man tag it was a three-way tag match like what did you want them to do? Like I, I – and even even the Trinasta thing you mentioned where he goes, who's stupid now? Like he acts like – they're acting like he did like this sinister trick or outsmarted him. It's a three-way tag match. Like it's completely right, – Right. They hit, they hit, the their, they hit their finisher on their opponents. It, it, it's yeah. a no disqualification three-way match. They hit their finisher on a guy and one clean. And Chris Nelson even at one point describes it as the backseat boys turning on the carnage crew. And Cabe says that the backseats stole the victory. Like, and, and to me, if the match was really great, I would have been like, oh, that was weird. But I, I thought the match even – it wasn't – like it's short. It's not anything special. It's not like gouge out your eyes terrible. But I also felt like – so much of it was wrong on the outside. It doesn't really play to some of the backseats and special case strengths, which is, you know, they can fly around. It does play to some of their bumping special case bumping ability. But yeah, just uh, th that 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 one part really took me out of the match. But Trevor, the brawling hats, <laughs> the brawling hats were a highlight. <laughs> the man on woman violence, not good, as you described in detail. I'll I'll just add. 
Gabe, after that, after the the triple forced kiss happened, says, "It's not the first men they've kissed tonight. These these special case sluts, they spend their money on hotel rooms to bang guys in. Like they just walk around. They just walk around like smooching people. Like what's the? Oh, either that's a massive burn. Like <laughs> they spend money on. They book a Holiday Inn Express to have sex. And like, okay." Like, I don't know what that what the problem is there, but um, they're women who have <laughs> who enjoy their freedom. Uh, like, clearly, this again, Gilead. That's what that's what's going on. And remember, Gibbs Polsky from Boston. That's where Gilead is, or that's oh, that's where the Handmaid's Tale is set. I should say they have intercourse to men they are betrothed to. Ooh, like, just, um. So next up, we have... Under his eye. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we have uh, the Ring of Honor number one contenders trophy four-corner survival match. BJ Whitmer and Dan Moth both defeat Matt Stryker and Xavier in 14 minutes, 10 seconds, when both men simultaneously pinned Matt Stryker after Dan Moth hit him with a, a lariat. And when I was talking before about the six-way, how so many multi-man matches now in Ring of Honor fall into the tropes, this one is just – it's if you've seen one of these four ways, you've seen this one. It's all the tropes. It's the multi-man submission. It's the starting in kind of an orderly fashion and descending into just everyone going into the ring, hitting their big moves at the end. There's the dive train. It's another really mediocre match because maybe I would enjoy it a bit more if I haven't seen so many Ring of Honor matches fall into this formula. But it, it is just such a formula match here. And there's a bit of, I guess the only things that set it apart is there was a couple sequences that are a bit stiffer than you might expect in a standard match. Like uh, Moff really seemed to beat the hell out of Xavier at a couple points here. Later on, it looks like BJ Whitmer took a really rough big boot right to the side of his head or neck that hit really hard. Um, Yeah, there's just not, there's... Nothing too special, but I thought Xavier looked the best of the four, which is another one of these matches where Xavier's on his way out and his push is long since over, and he actually looks as good as he has in a long time, which is kind of depressing to me. And it's another match where Gabe tries to sell all, like we talked about just a few minutes ago, all the opportunities Matt Stryker is getting because he won the tournament. He's in a match here on equal ground with three people that were also in the tournament. So what did he get out of it? Like... He could have lost the tournament and also have been in this match, and he doesn't win this match, by the way. So, yeah, there, there. I, I, I just uh. yeah, there are a bunch of uh, annoying things. Like, well, first of all, like at one point, even Gabe says, like, if Stryker wins, he'll be in the pure title tournament and get a world title shot on the same show. And first of all, a that's excessive. B didn't he already earn a world title shot? Like, what's What's happening here? Um, at one point, even the crowd screams – someone in the crowd screams boring, although this being Ring of Honor, the other fans yell at him. So I guess they're still being polite. Um, I was – I noted at the beginning, I was like, where is um, Prince Nana? You know, this is Xavier's first match since joining that group. His new manager isn't even there. And Gabe says that Nana is in Japan scouting for uh, the um, – scouting for the embassy. So I guess I guess the outcast killers are in Japan. Um <laughs> Maybe Jimmy Rave was over there too. I don't know. Um, but um, yeah, there's just like a lot of weird, annoying things. Another annoying thing, like Stryker and um, Xavier were having a big fight. Like in the in, obviously they're wrestling each other is what I meant to say as part of the rules of this match. Um, and at one point they're like, well, who do you tag? Because you just got, you got Whitmer and you got Moff and they're both part of the prophecy and you can't trust them. And I'm just thinking like, why do you need to trust them? Like you're tagging them in to, and you're also wrestling again. Like within the rules of the match, you do not need to trust your opponents. Yeah, you assume like, that they are going to try to hurt you. This is, it's exactly like the last match. It's another match where they act like there should be friends in an everyone for themselves match. Yeah. It's weird. Um, I guess some like wrestling highlights, like there was a, um, you know, like a pretty significant chop fight between Xavier and Moff that I thought was pretty good. Um, there was um, like uh, Whitmer is trying to heal it up a little bit. He does like eye pokes and stuff like that. And like you said, like some of Xavier's high spots, the springboard twisting dive, I thought was pretty cool. Um, you know, he also does. Um, 
like a like a, a four fifty on Moff, and that breaks uh, every everything up. Like after Moff gets a, a hold on Striker, and Striker has the Striker lock on Whitmer. So like like stuff like that. But like you said. It's an unmemorable version of a match we've seen a million times. Even the ending, you know, the double pin, you know, I guess like they they did it because there was precedent because what was it, Punk and Daniels that got the double pin on was it Carino or Joe at the uh, at the at the main event spectacle show? They got a double pin on somebody. I forget already. But now this is just like Carino. yeah, this is just three months later and they're doing that same finish again. At least this time it leads to something concrete, so I'll give them that. But. You know, it doesn't make for the most aesthetically pleasing ending of a wrestling match. And I also felt like it, it also did Matt Stryker a bit of a disservice because the ending is Moff hits a lariat on um, uh, on Stryker and then he covers and then Whitmer covers at the same time. So they both get credit for the pinfall. But it's like Matt Stryker is losing clean to a lariat. After he won the field, two shows after he won the Field of Honor tournament, which we were told over and over again was going to skyrocket the winner to the top. And it just, I realized this win is setting up a match for the very next show, but it, it's just, it, it's weird. And there, there's a moment in this match that I think is like a great, like, it's a great summation of Matt Stryker's whole push at this point, which is they do the dive train spot. And I think like Xavier does a big dive. And Dan Moff does a big dive. And then Matt Stryker, they save Matt Stryker's dive for last. And it's a perfectly okay dive. Like he basically just like takes a forward roll like over the top rope. He just jumps over the top and or he just flips over the top rope onto people. But it's like clearly of the three, the the least special dive. But they saved it for last. And normally on these dive trains, you want the biggest dive or the most impressive guy doing it last. And it's kind of like Stryker's push where – we're, we we keep he keeps getting presented like he's the special, but he's not showing he's special. He's just solid. Yeah, and and uh, it was just kind of a weird moment. There's a couple moments in this match where they try and do the uh, tension between Moth and Whitmer, like they tease that they get both get tagged in at the same time, like oh they're gonna have to fight each other, but instead they attack the other two that just tagged them in, and really they really mostly just tease them the tension at the very end when one accidentally hits the other and then you have the double pin. But yeah, just I'm not really into this Moff Whitmer feud, especially when we've already seen it, tw- them wrestle twice in 2003 and it was fine, but we've seen that match. And so the idea of like feuding within the stable, not into it. I did kind of laugh after the match when the ring announcer announces the result as double pin. Like with a real question in his voice, like, <laughs> like he's confused at what he's been told to announce the match. But so yeah, just again, if you haven't seen every one of these, if you haven't been watching every show with us, like you might enjoy this match more. I have this fear that maybe we're just getting jaded by the formula, but it's not terrible. Just very mediocre to me. Also, the whole point of ROH early was they wanted people to buy all the DVDs, so it's not like it, we're watching it in a way that it wasn't intended to be seen. Actually, that's a great point. It's not like at this point they're ramping it up a bit, but still not like a crazy amount of shows to keep up with. So right. we go backstage for a Jim Cornette promo. He's sitting down and the Briscoes are standing on either side of him holding their Ring of Honor tag titles. Cornette again calls Ring of Honor the Ring of Honor. Uh, Jim says that he got even with Christopher Daniels a while ago and now he's going to get revenge on Samoa Joe for laying him out. He makes some Samoan snipes at Joe, like some really outdated, like 80s sni- racist kind of snipes saying that, you know, he's the one generation removed from eating raw fish with his hands. And he takes a dump behind a tree. And I just thought to myself, don't a lot of people eat raw fish now? Like maybe in the 70s, you could have like put down a Samoan person for eating raw fish. Don't we all just do that now? And it's called sushi. Like how dare – like you're a Neanderthal. You eat raw fish. Like, oh, OK. Um, This guy wraps up beans and cheese in a tortilla. (laughs) What the hell is going on here? Mm -hmm. Um, Joe says tonight, Joe, I mean, uh, Cornette says tonight that Joe and Jerry Lynn are going to feel the wrath of the racket. Hey, that's a different show. Yeah. Cornette and the Briscoes and they're going to feel the wrath of the Briscoes. And then one of the Briscoes will defeat Joe at a later date to win the Ring of Honor world title. He says the Brisco. He asks the Briscoes then what teams would be next for them after that. Jay suggests the Backseat Boys. 
Cornette says they're only good for ripping off the Midnight Express's music. Mark says the Carnage crew. Jim calls them a couple of Al Bundy shoe salesman wannabes, which I have to say is a pretty good way to put down the Carnage crew. Yeah, gimmick. it's accurate. Yeah. That, that, like he basically found a p- good pop culture way to sum up that gimmick. Like I never thought of that before. I was like, that's actually – they are kind of like wrestling Al Bundy. That's that's ex- like. That is what they are, definitely. <laughs> and – uh Jay then says the Second City Saints and Cornet says they're holier than thou preachers and in this business you have to be dirty. Cornet says no one's going to take the Briscoes titles and they're establishing a dynasty. Jim Cornet continues to be a guy where I feel like he's the right guy in the wrong place at the wrong time because his promos always are really charismatic. They always have good delivery. The thing about Cornet's promos is they always have a clear point. They're always building things up, either a next show or a next feud. But some of his things are a little outdated. They always seem a little bit too hacky for Ring of Honor, like the Ring of Honor or the Samoan jibes for this promo. But it's like when he's not sounding outdated, like he's still a really I – mean, he's one of the greatest managers of all time. Yeah, no, and I think we actually see it in the match too, like um, which we'll get to later. But he's like, I think there's a tendency among like modern fans to discount, you know, Jim Cornette, like as he's as kind of a relic. But on this show, you know, like I said, the racism stuff is a problem. Um, but it's not like he's the only one that does problematic stuff in ROH at this time. Um, but he shows that he's still really good at what he does. Yeah, I, I think like I described this on, with on the Joe Sposto episode where we talked about it quite at length there, I believe. And I think my opinion of that is holds true, which is like Cornet is the kind of guy where 80 percent of what he says or even what he does in a wrestling show is really good. But it's just that he'll occasionally say that one thing that kind of rubs you the wrong way and it yep. takes you out of it. Yep. But like so much of like if he had an editor in his brain, like a more efficient editor – like so much of what he does, what he says, like just the other night he was doing commentary for uh, the NWA show. And from what I, I ch- had it play in the background a little bit and he sounded really, really good, you know, for the most part. And this is 15 years after this show. So, yeah. And I guess the one other thing I want to say about this, although it also plays into what happens in the main event tonight, is in a way Cornette's great for the Briscoes because at this point in their career – they did not have charisma or mic skills yet. They were still developing that. But on the other hand, it's kind of not good because Cornet has so much charisma and is such a like a motor mouth that it almost overwhelms the Briscoes. Like it, they almost seem like flunkies compared to like just Cornet's flunkies. Like even the way they're just kind of standing to the side and speaking when prompted. Yeah, I agree like, with that. Like they just they just had too little charisma in these settings to make you even remember that they were there. And, and I don't blame Cornette for that, but it's just when you put someone like as charismatic and as strong a personality as Cornette with people that, you know, very young Briscoes that don't have any comfort talking yet, he's just running over them, you know? Right. Maybe, maybe the way you could, maybe you could frame it differently, like frame the, the camera shot. I don't know what you could do, but there's got to be some way to make it a little bit better than it was. Like, cause yeah, it feels like it could be any tag team right. with Cornette there. So we go elsewhere backstage where we find Gary Michael Capetta in a hallway so poorly lit that for a while we can only see the outline of his head and not his facial features. Uh, He soon walks into a room with a fuming prophecy that thankfully is slightly better lit. Gary says Ring of Honor officials sent him to give the prophecy some news, and he tells Moth and Whitmer they are co-number one contenders for the Ring of Honor world title and will face Samoa Joe in a three-way for the title at the next show. Gary then explains another wrinkle to this, which is if Joe pins either man in the match, he remains champ and there's no new number one contender. If either Moth or Whitmer pins Joe, they're the Ring of Honor world champion, but if Moth pins Whitmer or Whitmer pins Moth, they don't win the Ring of Honor title, <laughs> but they become the sole number one contender for a future match. I need a scorecard to keep up with this. Yeah, this is comically convoluted. Like, it's ridiculous. Someone had to have been like, this just all sounds ridiculous. <laughs> Allison, and then did you notice at the end, Allison Danger does not seem happy with this and says, I have to call Chris about this, which seems weird because this seems like a pretty good deal for the prophecy. Like, right. The only way they lose is if Joe beats one of them, which, you know, you, you're going to have to worry about that no matter what. Like, Yeah. And- you know, I mean, I guess she doesn't want dissension in the ranks either, but yeah, it's mostly a pretty good deal. 
Like it's a two on one match if they work together. It's a I just yeah, oh, but it's such a weird convoluted thing. It's it's also weird. Okay, here's another thing that's weird about it. Um, on the uh, on the previous show on uh, Battle Enter John, the prophecy were the baby faces. Yes. Yeah. Are they anything like baby faces on this show? Uh, no, no, they're the bad guys. They're yeah, they're I mean, they're, 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 they're taking. They're interrupting Colt's fun, good times, great memory second. They're injuring him later when he's not a part of a match. You know, they're they're like not being noble people because they're constantly fighting and like sniping at each other. Like they're they they're very heelish here. Right. So I mean, just did anybody think of this? Did anybody think like we made these guys clearly the heroes on the previous show, and now we're muddying the waters like a lot on this show? You know the answer to that. Yeah. Matt. You know yeah. the answer. But I, I just point, think this this one might be the most egregious example of what we've been talking about for a while with the heel face stuff. And I, I think what makes it funnier is that, like, they did, I don't think they knew this at the time, but they're doing all these convoluted rules and so much build up to this dynamic of it's going to be a three way with two guys of the same um, stable who are kind of feuding. And yet, like, we know that the match on the next show is actually a four-way with low key in it. Yes, and Samoa Joe just wins it. So all this stuff is all for naught. And they put low key in there because they wanted to sell tickets and because they were getting kind of desperate. I guess the advance wasn't great, so this wasn't their intent. But it just makes it even funnier knowing that like all this work that isn't really that engrossing to begin with, and all these convoluted rules, convoluted rules, aren't going to end up going anywhere really. <laughs> But boy, that match is much more enticing with Loki in it, isn't it? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and, and that goes back to what we were saying before about how they can do so much build up to stuff. But like you said, it, like good matches and good wrestlers are what draws. Like they're, they're doing this whole show trying to build up this match, and it and it still doesn't become nearly as interesting as just Loki's in it. Well, this is tr- this is true of WWE, like even more so, right? Like that they, like they have an exciting matchup, and then when they actually start booking their angles, they make the match much less exciting. Um, yeah. Just like the concept of something is often a lot better than the uh, the writing around that thing. The, yeah, the booking looks good on paper, but you have to take into account how over and how talented are the guys you're putting these pushes on, right? right. Next, we're we're after um, intermission for Alex Shelley defeats Jimmy Jacobs by submission in 12 minutes, 30 seconds using the Border City stretch. Ring of Honor's website wrote before this match, officials, Ring of Honor officials are very high on Jimmy Jacobs and Alex Shelley and will give them an opportunity to steal the show this Thursday in the Baltimore area. Did they steal the show, Matt? Uh, no, but they did give them the opportunity to. Like I, I, I will say that they had they gave him you know, a decent amount of time. They you know let him sh- do their showcase match. Um, I thought you know maybe because it was after intermission. I thought the crowd hurt the match a lot. Um, you know they weren't disrespectful, but they were quiet. Um, but they tried really hard. You know, like I, I even wrote uh, like when, like when I won the match first, pop. I was like, all right, guys, get this show moving. And they kind of did a little bit, you know, they worked their butts off, all the stuff they did looked good, but it did feel a little bit choreographed in the way that a lot of times you'll see like matches between two indie guys that kind of are paired together a lot. Um, So you get that kind of like, this is, this match is a bit too smooth and rehearsed, but Shelly, you know, did a lot of his innovative, you know, submissions, some stuff that I can't even describe. Um, And, you know, they're there and, you know, everyone's impressed with that. And then another storyline early in the match is just that they they match each other move for move. Like, you know, they, they do, like, simultaneous drop kicks. They both, like, they do a test of strength, and both guys do neck bridges on each other that the crowd is definitely impressed with. Um, you know, they, they do dives. And actually, one of the coolest spots was Jacobs, he tried a springboard dive to the floor, but Shelly caught him on his knee for, like, a stomach breaker on the floor. And I thought that was pretty cool, and that kind of... That put Shelley in control, and he was working on Jacobs' neck. Um, you know, just a, a bunch of cool moves. I, I don't know. Maybe the there was the the choreographed nature of it is what made me like be slightly disappointed in it. Um, whereas the Jacobs versus Saban match, I didn't from last show. I didn't have a ton of expectations for, and that you know over um, delivered on my expectations. This one maybe slightly under delivered, 
but I don't know if it was really anything that the guys did wrong. Um, at one point, Gabe is like, who's going to survive the match's closing moments? And then he realized, like, oh, I shouldn't know that this is the closing moments. And he was like, because uh, I, I don't see how we could go much longer with the abuse they're taking in this one. Um, so I enjoyed that. Um, but, you know, and they, they get down to the near falls at the end. Um, you know, um, Jacobs, he goes for the Contra code. He misses. And he gets a big boot for two. Uh, I liked that at one point in this match, Gabe straight up admitted that he doesn't understand the Huss stuff. But he's like, but the well, crowd seems to like it, so okay. Um, <laughs> uh, Shelly hits the shell shock. He gets two. Um, I guess they weren't calling it that yet. Or he, And then he goes right into the Border City stretch, which I think they also did not say the name of at that time. No, they did not. Yes. And he won with that. Um, I just think the lack of crowd heat and the rehearsal – aspect uh the rehearsed aspect of it kind of took it down for me but it was one of the better matches of the night i would say i don't think it stole the show but it was in the top tier of matches on this night for sure um uh, it was but then you could already start sort of see that shelly was turning heel a little bit they didn't go all the way there but like right before the handshake shelly slapped jacobs in the face and then jacobs mm-hmm. slapped him back and then they shook hands which i don't know what they were getting at there is kind of weird but um that happened and yeah, that was a match. <laughs> this is one of those matches where I I feel like our, our review of it is the same, but I still one of us liked it a bit better because like I completely agree with everything you say. I thought this was a good match. Not that you didn't think it was good, but I think I just liked it a bit more. I didn't think it was the show stealer that they were maybe hoping it would be, but it was it was always there. I would say the one of the big distingu- distinguishing characteristics of this match was like seventy eighty percent of this match was all innovative stuff. And that was kind of Alex Shelley's calling card at this time to the point where they talk about it on commentary, how, you know, he's innovative but not innovative for innovative sake. And there's so many things in this match that they're either things you've never seen before or they're slight tweaks to familiar things. And even, like, a lot of the submissions of this match are almost treated like just high spots in a spot fest where they're inventive and they're only on for a few seconds. Like they're not trying to tell you a story in this match. They're not trying to um, like do any like long sequences of submissions where a guy's really struggling and in pain or working on a body part too much. It's more about here's a cool submission. Okay. Before you can get bored of it, here's another cool submission. Here's a cool spot. But the thing I really agree with you on is it does feel a little artificial at times, and you, I think you hit the nail on the head. Of It feels artificial in, or f- kind of rehearsed in the way when two guys have wrestled each other a lot, like how that can do. Because these two had wrestled each other like a million times in places, primarily IWA Mid-South. And in fact, they mentioned on commentary, you know, they drove to the show together. They drove 12 hours or whatever from Michigan or whatever to make this show. And... If sometimes when you have those touring partners and they wrestle in new places, sometimes it feels like you're almost seeing their greatest hits rather than like them inventing things on the spot. Other examples we've seen in ROH would be the early Punk versus Cabana matches, and also um, Jody Fleisch against Johnny Storm from uh, Road to the Title. Those were two matches that I could think of where I kind of had similar thoughts. Yeah, and, and I don't blame them because I could imagine when you're going to a bigger promotion, you're probably going – and you've wrestled someone a long time. You're like, let's do the stuff we know works best. And maybe I'm maybe I'm reading too much into it and they didn't even do that. But there are definitely moments where I picked up on that same thing you did, which is this feels like a little too neat in a way. Yeah. Like not neato cool stuff, although there was neato cool stuff in it. But just like it's a little too smooth in some respects. Like they yeah. they're doing stuff they know – really well here. yeah when i say that it's not like i'm saying they shouldn't have done that like i think like that's perfect but it's also doesn't make for me to say this was the show stealer you know like yeah. it's like this is like this is good like they clearly they both got jobs out of it they impressed like great but i'm not i'm also not gonna lie and say that i thought it was an amazing match it, it was refreshing though where so many guys in ring of honor we've talked about this before when their first couple matches before they get in, they're either like buried in a four or six way and, and they only get a few minutes to shine or they're in like a four or five minute match way deep on the undercard. This was actually a chance where the Ring of Honor website wasn't lying. Like they did give them a good opportunity here with yes. 12 minutes and they let them just, you know, no one else was in there to distract anybody or steal focus. And I did feel like 
even though the match wasn't a show stealer match, it was good enough that if I was just watching this at the time, I'd be like, yes, I want to see both these guys back in Ring of Honor. Definitely. Like, and, and I also think that if this was on a hotter show in front of a hotter crowd with better production values, I think the match would have come off even that much better. One thing that you brought that I, I didn't I want to make sure I remembered is how much I think you understated like you correctly point something out, but I think you understated how much Gabe does not seem to be a fan of Jimmy Jacobs like character. Like this is not the first show. I think he's done that thing where he's like, I don't get the Hus gimmick, but fans seem to like it. And then later there's a moment where um he go Gabe says there's a lot of empty space in Jimmy Jacobs head, even though I think <laughs> he's technically supposed to be a face right now. And then later on there's a moment where Jacobs gets a near fall late in the match off that big boot. And like you mentioned, and Gabe asks Chris Nelson, if that is that boot as good as Bruder, Bru- Bruiser Brody's? And they both agree that it isn't. And it's like, OK, t- you're, you're right. But like, why even bring that up? Like, like it felt like Gabe had like a little bit of a grudge against Jimmy Jacobs here. Yeah, this is one of the things like a criticism that I have of Gabe in general, which is that he really seems to overvalue his own personal taste when it comes to booking. Um, like this is something that works. Jimmy Jacobs is talented. He's over, like, just embrace it, man. Like it's, it's fine. Like you don't have to love every single thing that you're doing. Like as long as it's not like morally objectionable, just go with it. Like people like it. It's fun. Like just relax. Like I, I, I think that, you know, obviously I think Gabe was, was a really good booker. Like I think he did amazing things with ROH, but I don't think that you have to lean so heavily on what you like, um, when you're booking, if you want to be booking for a, you know, for your audience, you want to look at what the audience likes. Am I, I, am I right or wrong? Am I wrong about this? You're absolutely right. I think the biggest problem is, is the fact that it's coming out in public. Like he's on commentary and he, he has the tone of voice where it sounds like at times he's almost embarrassed that Jimmy Jacobs is on his product with this gimmick and that that gimmick is as popular as it is. Like he's almost apologetic in tone at times. Yeah. Like uh, these crazy kids like it, but you know, I can't say I'm a great fan of it. Like it, it, that's that's a weird way to sell a guy, especially when you're supposed to be like the straight play by play guy who and Jimmy Jacobs is not supposed to be a heel at this point. Like, but you know, like there's a, like you know he'll say similar stuff about like lucha and stuff like that. You know what I mean? And it's just like mm-hmm. like what you, what you think is not always the most important thing. Although I will say there were times where Gabe would eventually give in, like um. Chris Hero was the big one. I mean, I yep. think Gabe will admit for a long time he did not get Chris Hero, and then he eventually gave in. And once he saw he was working, he kept booking him. And then I think he did eventually really get Chris Hero later in his career to the point where in Evolve, you know, he was the champ there for a while. So. Oh, yeah. He definitely – he realized he was wrong. But like I think that's should that's good evidence where like you shouldn't always just – you shouldn't always just go with your taste if the audience is telling you something different. Yeah. And – uh I also felt kind of bad because I left this note out of the other match, but I guess from the PW Insider Live report, they said that uh, they were giving credit to Slick Wagner Brown because he had to drive to make to get a flight to Puerto Rico. So they said right after the match, he had to drive from Baltimore to Boston to get a flight to Puerto Rico that next morning. Holy fuck. There. So, but I, I felt kind of bad this match because Gabe really sells the – these two had to drive 12 to 13 hours together from Michigan – and Gabe does not mention the, the Slick Wagner Brown drive at all, so his drive does not get put over. The life, the life of a wrestler, man. These guys are determined. Yeah, um, but yeah, there was some lots of really there's lots of really cool spots here, novel spots, and like I said before, sometimes I feel like um, Shelley can be innovative for innovative sake, but I felt the spots here looked like they hurt and looked like they had some points to them but the thing that was most over in this match i think was just a really simple spot where he does a transition from a schoolboy into a cross face from getting schoolboy and it's so fluid and fast i paused it at one point and there were like three or four fans in the hard camera side that their mouths are like open in o shapes like ooh, and (laughs) and it gets applause and it's just a really cool moment and for so many innovative things it was kind of a reminder that Sometimes the coolest thing is just if you do something a little bit simpler, like really smoothly. Yes. But anyway, we go on to the semi-main event. Homicide with Julius T. Smokes <laughs> defeats CM Punk with Tracy Brooks and Colt Cabana at his side via pinball in 20 minutes even after he hit the cop killer. Um, 
So this is another thing where Ring of Honor's website really hyped it up. Uh, their website said, Homicide and CM Punk are both really looking forward to competing against each other this Thursday in Baltimore. For some reason, Homicide is particularly emotional about this match and has stated he's coming to put on the best match of his career. Um, not only was this not the best match of, of his career, this wasn't the best CM Punk uh, Homicide match we've seen in Ring of Honor because I would say their match at Round Robin Challenge 2 was significantly better than this. That match, it was... It had a couple rough spots, but it was like a very quick, very action-packed ma- match. This match goes a lot slower, and it doesn't really build to like a great payoff. Like It does get faster near the end, but there's not a great story to it that justifies the slowness, because I love a great slow story, and it still has a bit of that roughness. It, particularly, there's a spot where... Um, CM Punk goes for a springboard sunset flip and he overshoots it and Homicide has to very awkwardly like walk backwards to get into Punk's grip. But for the most part, this is just a really middle of the road match from two really talented guys. And I guess one of the big stories, and even though one of the live reports mentioned this, like um, Julius Smoke's interactions with uh, Colt Cabana on the outside and Tracy Brooks, they almost like, overtake the first half of the match like like they're they're so they're almost distracting and stealing the focus from the match and for a match that's supposed to be that they're selling as this is the most important match of homicide's life it in no way is worked like that it doesn't feel like that not even just from a quality standpoint it just doesn't feel as important i don't know if you felt the same way or if you disagreed no i agree completely um yeah the um the stuff on the outside yet was more entertaining than the match and that's not necessarily good because, like, the, you, like, these are two main eventers. For one thing, I thought it was weird that of all the shows, this is the one they decide to not have CM Punk do any mic work on. For one thing, it's after a really major angle involving him. His opponent that he injured gets mic time. Um, this match really probably could have used a little bit of character work to explain the stakes of this match since these guys don't really have any storyline connection to each other in any way. And there was a lot of stalling in the early part of this match. Just like a lot. You know, Punk gets into it with the ref. You know, there's all this stuff with Julius Smokes. It's just just stalling and stalling and stalling. Um, at one point at the beginning, um, um, Punk looks on his entrance and he goes, there's no place like home. So I'm like, is he like a Baltimore saint now or something? Like, I don't know what was going on there. But, um, yeah, I... Um, it's uh, you know it's considering because you compared this to the uh, the match from Round Robin Challenge, and both guys have considerably raised their profiles since then, right? Like they are both yeah. main eventers at this point, and this did not feel like it. This felt like guys that were. I mean, listen, I'm not criticizing them, you know, and every you don't have to do the best match ever on every show, but these guys were not shooting for the moon here, um, which again is fine, but it also means that this match wasn't great, and. Um, yeah, I don't really have too much to say about the match other than it was slow. It uh, it was weird that Gabe kept saying, "I predict this match will end in a knockout," because <laughs> like I thought that you know I thought this was like you know Nostradamus Gabe where he was like foreshadowing something. Turned out that no, Homicide just won with the cop killer. I do think that the storyline they were building with Homicide even before I saw the promo at the end was weird like because they're just like you know homicide you know he's, he's you know we don't know what's going on with him he wants he says it's the most important match of his life and he's all emotional and then he wins right he wins clean yeah. over like a top guy and like what does that mean what are the stakes there um i don't know but this match was uh was not great <laughs> I don't know how many times in wrestling history where a match has been built up as hugely important, but we won't tell you why until after the match is over. And then you like, – yeah, well, I'll get to the promo, but you still don't totally find out why even then. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like um, – like the only thing I can think of that's even close to compare a comparison, and it isn't, but is like – the old Undertaker Giant Gonzalez rest in peace match where they're like, you're going to have to watch to find out what it is. And then it's just a regular match. And then yes. it's like, I guess that's what, what a rest in peace match is. Like, a match. <laughs> and that's kind of what this felt like. Like you're like left going, what? Like, okay. Am I ever going to get the answer to this? And, and the answer is just kind of like, eh. I, it- I, 
even in the post match, like you have, um, like there, you have uh, the the prophecy. Like they come out and they jump Cabana and they ram him into the post and um, they you know they work on his shoulder while Homicide and Smokes are protecting CM Punk for some reason, like and the, and you know Tracy Brooks is tending to uh, tending to Cabana. You know they after the match, you know they're still talking about like Homicide. His like his mood is weird, right? But doesn't he seem totally normal like during all yeah. these spots? Like he just seems like fine. He's like, he, and he's a baby face and everything's fine and he's just. Normal homicide who wins a match. He even slaps ha- hands with Punk after everything is done, which is yeah. pretty, pretty like if you get a hand slap from homicide. He's in a good mood. You think? You yeah. Know, not everyone gets that. Right. Um, I thought like as a match, like we're really down on, but I, I feel like it's like a little bit above average. I would say as a wrestling match, not nothing special. It's a fine think- match, but it's not. It's like you know, it's like probably on the caliber of like. The Jacobs versus Shelley match, or even less good than that. Yeah, I would say it's a little less good. I, I would say this is like, if I had to use star ratings for once, like a two and a three quarter or three star match. Yeah, three and, three star match. Yeah, exactly. Like, and it's from two guys that are really talented who have had a better match in this promotion. And they, they got, got and they got time. Yeah, twenty minutes in a set, and they were building it up as maybe this that Homicide was going to make this the best and most important match of his career. So when you put all that on it. Then yeah, that I think that's why we're kind of if we sound harsh, it, it's because of all that. Like it's pretty disappointing in that context, I would say. Right, and there was just so many layers that they were trying to get across that they didn't really do a good job of getting across. And uh, you know, you could think of a few things they could have done differently to get that across, and they just didn't bother. So yeah, disappointing. But you know, can't they can't all be uh, classics? It did have my favorite version of Homicide's Tope Conhilo though, where he uh lands sitting on uh, yes. the, in the first row. He basically lands, rotates just perfectly so he's like sitting on the guardrail in the first row and then he high fives fans there while he's there. Like if you ever get that, that's like the one out of 50 Tofei Kun heel. It's, it's the best. Clearly the move of somebody who's deeply emotional and sad. <laughs> so after the match, like Matt said, Moff and Whitmer come in, ram Cabana's shoulder into the ring post. This is, I presume, to write Cabana out for a show or two because, as we mentioned on a recent show, he apparently had injuries in both his shoulders that he needed to rehab. Um, homicide stares uh, and Smokes stare down the prophecy and get them to leave. Smokes moons them, so another moon. From Thankfully, the hard camera does not catch that. Um Colt sells the injury big. He's held to the back, blah, blah, blah. So at the end of the match, it just seemed like they were stalling really badly. Um, like th- there's like an extra 15 seconds of homicide and smokes lingering and making their way to the back. That'd be cut out probably of 90% of other releases. Like, I just think we can't stress enough how, if you, if you watch every show, how different this show feels in terms of how much they're showing before and after the matches, like a kid, I think I described it to you on face in like Facebook messenger. It's, it's the feeling of like when a kid has to hit a word count on an English like term paper and they're just stretching things to no point, but to stretch it out because they have to. Yep. So, and that leads us to the main event the Ring of Honor tag team titles on the line. The Briscoes successfully defend the titles against Jerry Lynn and Samoa Joe in 16 minutes when Jay pins Joe after he hit him with a shot with Jim Cornette's tennis racket. So this is not the end of the Briscoes-Joe feud, but it is the end of the part of the feud of Joe trying to get random dream partners to take on the Briscoes. Um, he First he had AJ Styles. Then he had Brian Danielson. Now finally it's Jerry Lynn. He loses a third time. Matt, where do you think this stacks up in those three matches? I'd put this at solidly number two of the three. Uh, I was pleasantly surprised by how much I like this match because I haven't heard much about it over the years, um, through the years. <laughs> um, I, uh, you know, Neither of us were super crazy or Tajiri about the, uh, <laughs> about the Danielson tag match that they had on the last show. <laughs> This match was a lot simpler. It was a lot more straightforward. Um, but that, I think, was to the match's benefit. I thought Jerry Lynn, you know, definitely added a different dynamic to the match. And I thought Jim Cornette did too, actually. Um, at the beginning, Cornette, you know, does his um, does his little intro for the Briscoes. But he also says, finally, Jim Cornette has come back to Baltimore. And doing like a rock reference here, I feel like is kind of lame. I don't know if you thought the same thing. Made him it- seem kind of... Kind of bush league. I don't know. 
it was weird, also weird because that's such a face, like a pandering baby face move. And the rest of the match, he's a heel. Well, well, yeah. Well, that's that's the other thing. At the, right at the end, he goes, "Let's have a good, clean match." Right? He says that to uh, Joe and um, and Lynn. And, um, and, you know, so like, there's that kind of like, oh, he's, he's trying to be an insincere baby face. I guess that's sort of what they're getting at here. And, and then right after that off mic, he, he calls Joe a fish eating, uh, coconut breaking Samoan again. Like, so, and that, that he says that to the Briscoes, like off the microphone, but clearly in, you know, in audible range of the camera that's recording him. But so this is the first Jerry Lynn match since road to the title in ROH, but you know he's so he's he sort of does like the simple like veteran babyface role, but he looks good. Like he's his his stuff is good. He does a lot of jaw jacking with Cornette early, mm-hmm. like um, Cornette. He says something like, um, "Oh, he yeah he's so." Um, Cornette is uh, complaining about the stuff Jerry Lynn's doing. He's like, that's illegal. And obviously it's not illegal. And Lynn goes, it's called wrestling. The WWF fired me for it. And then Cornette says, well, if you won some matches, you would uh, you would have been able to keep your job. And I thought that was kind of a cute spot. The crowd definitely popped for it, whatever you want yeah. to think. But then it leads the announcers into this whole thing about it's always going to be the WWF to me. I can't get that E. Uh, in. <laughs> and doesn't that seem so quaint now? Um it seems so outdated. Like, yeah. like crazy to think that like there was a day, like a day and age back then. I remember where people were like, we were melting down collectively about, oh, it'll never be the same, you know, WWE. Like, I can't get over it. Or, and like, it, it, this is one of the rare times during a Ring of Honor show where it seems really dated, like just in terms of the timeline, like references like that. Yes, like, very much. I'll just start talking about like George Bush or, or things like that. Like, yes. Yeah, they could get get real timely with it. They'll be like, I enjoy Queer Eye for the straight guy. <laughs> right? Because that's what it was called, if you don't remember, kids. Um, but um, so during all this talk, Joe is dominating Mark. And it leads to this to Lynn tagging in, and he's, and, you know, his baby face shine stuff looks good. And then Joe runs in, and he narks Mar- Mark off the apron, hits a tope, goes for the ole ole kick on Jay, but Mark cuts him off with, like, a big dive. I love the stuff where Joe is just, like, showing off his crazy athletic stuff. I really enjoy that. And, like, while this is all going on, Cornette gets in the ring, then Lynn confronts Cornette, and then Mark attacks uh, Lynn from behind, which leads to the Briscoes taking over. Just, like, good, simple, old-school wrestling stuff. I, I really enjoyed that. Um... So the Briscoes took over on Lynn, although I think technically he wasn't actually legal because I think J- uh, Joe had tagged in, but that's neither here nor there. Um, so, you know, they do like chin lock stuff, but, you know, it's fine. The crowd's into it. I think the crowd is, you know, into this more than any match of the night, which is good because it's the main event and that's kind of what you want. And I thought in that Dan- in that Danielson Joe against the Briscoes match, the crowd wasn't always so with it. But it's just a lot simpler stuff. Like uh, uh, eventually Mark goes for the shooting star press on Lynn. But Lynn moves. Then they hot tag to Joe, and Joe's, t- is, you know, he's chopping everybody. Does the power bomb into the STF? Lynn blocks Mark's save, uh, and Jay makes the ropes. Then Joe hits a lariat on Jay for two. Mark breaks that up, and then Lynn runs Mark to the floor. And then we go to the finish, which is that Cornette tries to hit Joe with the racket, but Joe takes it and punches Cornette. Then Jay hits Joe from behind with the racket and pins him. And while he's pinning him, Joe kicks out. And you know, I uh, and as we both found out, um, this was not supposed to be the finish. Um, they were supposed Joe was supposed to kick out. They were supposed to do a few more moves, but the Briscoes were supposed to win. And I think as far as like botched finishes goes, this wasn't as bad or anywhere near as bad as say the um, finish of the actual main event of WrestleMania this year. Um, yeah. This this one worked a lot better than that. So I thought it was fine, honestly. Like, and I thought the match was solid. I thought it was a good match, a solidly good. Three and a quarter, three and a half star tag team match. Fun stuff. Well worked. Crowd was into it. Fun. Um, finish was not great. <laughs> but considering how badly they botched it, not bad either. Uh, I, I completely agree. I, I feel like your star rating is dead on. Like the, I was thinking in my head, three and a quarter, three and a half. The problem, I guess, for this show is this show really could have used a match that was like four or above, like a like a show stealer. Because the rest of the show isn't terrible, but it just doesn't have that one reason. Like I would to go, you need to buy the show for this. And 
it, it this is this is probably in some ways the best match of the show, but it doesn't top out, you know, good enough to me to make me say you have to go see the show for this. But, would you agree with my ranking as far as the Briscoes Joe tag well, matches? Absolutely. And who I, I remember like uh, a few shows ago, you said after I think after we watched the AJ um, the AJ tag, you were like, get ready because they just declined from here. And so I was actually kind of scared going into this match that was going to be pretty bad because, like you said, we both were not big fans of the Danielson tag. But I would put this solidly too. Yeah, yeah, so, I agree. I agree. I was wrong about that uh, steady deck declining. But I mean, I, I don't blame you because on like it's been a long time since we've watched all of these, and like if like on paper, would you really say that Jerry Lynn would be better in a tag with the same guys than Brian Danielson? But yeah, nope. It just works better because the story just makes more sense. It's simpler. It's you know, the faces control for the first half and then some distractions from Cornette allows the Briscoes to control more of the second half. I genuinely it, believe Cornette added to this match, which is like the first time I've really said that about him in ROH. I would say that Cornette and Jerry Lynn were the two most over people in this match and maybe the show. Yeah, I would agree. And it, the only bad part about that is it's going back to what I said about what Cornette does to the Briscoes. I mean, the point of this match was kind to was to further the Joe versus Briscoes feud, but it almost seems like they're background players from for Cornette and Lynn, particularly like as you mentioned when they're like getting into verbal sparring with each other mid match. It, it, but I mean, at the same time, hey, those are obviously who the fans wanted to see. I think that spot you mentioned where Joe's going for the Olay kick and Mark catches him mid run with that dive over the top. It was just such a cool spot. That might've been my favorite spot of the whole show. Um, I wish we could have seen a bit more Joe. I, I feel like he, this was another match where everything he did looked really good. He looked really on point tonight, although he usually does, but I feel like I could have used a bit more Joe in this match that we got a lot of Jerry Lynn, which I understand because Jerry Lynn rarely shows up in ring of honor. So you got to get your, your Lynn's worth, but um, <laughs> But, but, and maybe we would have seen more. Like that's the one thing. This match, maybe this match could have been that really great match. I mean, the report, the things I read from the live reports used the words there were a few more spots planned. So that doesn't sound like there was going to be a lot left, but that they were planning to do probably you know a few says to me like maybe three or four big near falls and then get out of there. But this was you know I mean the right team that they wanted to win did win. But it, it, the match, like in a way, what I would describe the, the work of this match was it was like something we've rarely seen in Ring of Honor, which is like a good B-show effort. Like usually on shows, it so far it feels like usually guys are giving their best effort even if the match doesn't turn out great. This felt more like a house show style effort. Yes. Like we're, we're, going, we're going to try and give you a good match, but we're not doing everything we could do. And that is a bit like Ring of Honor isn't really built on that, although maybe as we're starting to get a few more B-shows, we're going to start seeing that level of effort more often. Something on a show that um, apparently, you know, we're, we talked about how they cut every they, – they let everything draw out to try and reach the 238. Um, one thing they did find necessary to cut out along with the SAT match was apparently the fact that – Fans saw Booker gave Sapolsky lose his cool at ringside at the at the at the finish of this match. So we did not see that on the home release. So obviously they found a way to cut that or <laughs> didn't shoot that. But one of Gabe's infamous like um angry meltdowns that which again, like you were saying, it's not that crazy of a botch. Like it's not that obvious. So that only drew attention to it. Like he should have just not acted like that yeah and um only other note i have from this match is gabe on commentary says jay briscoe proved he could beat joe when they wrestled that tradition continues joe, jay briscoe lost that match clean right like, yeah he he beat joe at the um in the uh in the four way to get that match but he lost that match clean right exactly yeah, yeah like it's a different show, and I realized what he was trying to say was, like, he looked so competitive with Joe, he looked like he could beat him on another night, like, that's when he proved he could stand toe-to-toe, -to -toe. but when you just say, like, he proved he could beat Joe, like, he lost that match, like, it sounds really weird to say that. Right. But... The, the other thing is, at the, the post-match we didn't mention, 
which is that um, I guess you like you said it was probably improvised that since the referee quote screwed Joe on the finish, Joe hit what he hit an island driver on the referee. Hit, it looked like a fire thunder driver, and then a pretty he, he shoved it's ref Gary Moyer or G- Gary Moyer by the way who uh who uh was the ref that botched the thing, and then he did you notice that Joe shoved him pretty roughly like I did not like, but. That's bad. And then and then Lynn hits him with a cradle pile driver. Right. And it's like – so I get that this was improvised and it wasn't planned. But it is weird to think that the baby faces in this honor promotion where the one of the codes of honor is no attacking the referees can just get away with attacking the referee. And there is really zero repercussions for doing that. Um, but so, – so maybe they should have just like done that for the live crowd and not use it on the DVD. I don't know. Um but oh, did you also notice that Cornette was bleeding from the mouth after the Joe must have really hit him? Yes, I did notice that. Yes, uh, the the he's one you know the, the casualties of the wrestling wars. <laughs> Call back. <laughs> so I sorry I interrupted you. It sounded like you were going to say something else. Do you remember? Uh, I do not remember now. No, uh, uh, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't think it was anything. Don't worry. Okay, so we cut immediately to a backstage promo from a furious Samoa Joe. He's screaming. He's kicking stuff. He's pissed about the ref. He's pissed about the racket shot. Joe says he wants – by the way, it was a really weak-looking racket shot too to the back, which probably added to the anger over the finish. Uh, Joe says he wants Jay Briscoe with no racket, no managers, just him and Jay locked in a steel cage. Joe basically says if Jay wants a title shot – that's what he has to do. Face me in a cage. Joe Gen- then transitions to Dan Moth and BJ Whitmer, who are fighting him for the title at the next show. Joe quickly mentions that he's beaten them both before. And then Joe starts to finish up with his usual I am Samoa Joe, I am pro wrestling, when the prophecy attacks him mid catchphrase. Allison Danger says that the prophecy is three for three tonight. So I guess that was their three step plan was just to attack people. Yeah. And she dedicates <laughs> the attack to Christopher Daniels. Well, yeah, I, I, yeah, I guess they have this big elaborate plan. It's just, we are wrestlers. We hit people. <laughs> well, that was also just like her amazing plan for the four-way match was one of you guys should win this. Match <laughs> so lots of prophecy, not the greatest at plans, at, at inventive plans. It's like, King, it's like King Mabel's royal plan. <laughs> Deep cut. <laughs> cut to the prophecy somewhere else backstage. They're happy. Moff says they'll work together to beat Joe, but then Whitmer and Moff both start fighting over who's going to be the one to pin Joe and win the title. So again, this is the finally the last of 800 segments tonight building up that match, which won't even be a three-way. It'll be a four-way with Loki. So Worth it. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. And then jump finally to the real main event of the show. Oh, my God. I, Matt wants to say the promo in full, so first I'll just lead up to it. We jump to Sugar Sean Price backstage, who's trying to get a word from Homicide and Julius T. Smokes before they leave the building. They're about they're going through the door to the outside, but Price catches them. Price's interview style is to say, what's going on, and I'm trying to do my job here multiple times. Joe Smoke's response by going affirmative action, <laughs> like which pretty like ooh, tuck my collar there. Yeah, and then we get finally homicide explains it all. Matt, what did homicide say? Okay, well, so so keep in mind this whole night, the whole like ongoing storyline is what is going on with homicide, right? He's so emotional. This uh, he says is the most important match of his career, right? Every, just like, but he won't say anything. What's going on? So homicide. I am not going to do an homicide impersonation. I am just going to read the words that he said, word for word. Tonight, this might be the last night for myself in Ring of Honor. Tonight might be the last match for myself for my career. Do you understand me? So, first of all, we get that homicide. For the first we're hearing of this, he's basically saying he's going to leave Ring of Honor. He's going to retire. That is what he is saying. We don't know why. Let's see if he explains. I'm going away for a very long time. I don't know that I'm going to miss one show, two shows, three shows. You heard me? I don't know. I tell you this. Ring of Honor has been my heart and my strength. You heard me? Okay, so what we get right now is he says he's going to leave Ring of Honor. Yeah. But then he says he's going to miss maybe one show or two <laughs> shows or three shows. I don't know. 
So that's where we are right now. But so this big moment where he says he's going to retire, basically. But then I don't know. So then smokes, he says, let the blood clot, um, <laughs> which um, seems uh, like a non sequitur. But if you've watched Julius Smokes promos and homicide promos with Julius Smokes, it's not that weird. Homicide continues. I don't know when the hell I'm coming back, but I tell you this. Ring of Honor is my strength. And when I come back, there's going to be some hell to pay. Remember, ROH is my heart and my strength, and I am coming back. <laughs> and then Smoke says, Rockabye baby, let's bounce. Um, so basically this big dramatic moment is that Homicide retires and then decides he's not going to retire. <laughs> and that is it. And he leaves. And they, they leave, they bounce, um, Rockabye baby, and they are out. So I still don't know what's going on. If anyone can explain this to me, I guess there's maybe more explanation when Homicide does come back. Um, spoiler alert, he misses two shows. Um, <laughs> so he was on the money there. But he started the promo by saying, this might be my last night for myself in Ring of Honor. Tonight might be the last match for myself for my career. He ends this by saying, ROH is my heart and my strength, and I am coming back. It is as if over the course of the promo, he convinces himself he's not going to leave. Like first, he, he's he, this might be it for me, and I might be done. Then I might miss one, two, three shows. Then, if I come back, then I am coming back within the span of <laughs> one minute. <Yeah. laughs> yes. So I'm going to read this all again, just so we're clear on this. Okay. With uh, so tonight, this might be the last night for myself in Ring of Honor. Tonight might be the last match for myself and for my career. Do you understand me? I'm going away for a very long time. I don't know that I'm going to miss one show, two shows, three shows. You heard me? I don't know. I tell you this. Ring of Honor has been my heart and my strength. You heard me? Let the blood clot. I don't know when the hell I'm coming back, but I tell you this. Ring of Honor is my strength, and when I come back, there's going to be some hell to pay. Remember, ROH is my heart and my strength, and I am coming back. Rockabye baby, let's bounce. <laughs> Did you pull away for that last one? I just okay. covered my mouth. That is so good. I love that you went to that length. Thank you. Maybe, maybe though, you know, Homicide is just proving how true to Ring of Honor he is, because... Acting like you're going to be missing a show or two is like the biggest thing ever is like a new Ring of Honor trope. Because did you notice like, earlier in the show, they made a big point with the Alex Shelley-Jimmy Jacobs match, I think both on the site and on commentary, that the winner is going to get regular bookings and the loser, well, we don't know when they're going to show up again. Um, Jimmy Jacobs, I believe, misses one show, the next one. He then works the do or die pre-show for at our best, and then he is in a match uh, get an, on the show after that, a six-way that also has Alex Shelley in it. So it is another example of them acting like if you lose this, you know, you might never – You who knows if you'll ever get a booking here again. And then they're basically where they're always going to be. They should, and, cha they should change do or die to do or do. <laughs> Yeah, so on the most recent Honorable Mention podcast um, uh, for Stalemate, Jeff Schwartz did an impression of the uh, James Gibson post-match promo, again, after the Austin Aries match, where he talks about having his dick in his hand. And he said, that's his favorite promo in ROH history. I think this is my new favorite promo in ROH history, the one I just read from Homicide. It is bonkers. Like this is a, I think we said like on an early show that Homicide's one of those guys, almost like the Sandman, where they're not a good promo, but they're a great at being them. Like yes. They're a great, like Homicide, like Sandman isn't a great promo. He's a great Sandman. Uh, Homicide, this is like no better proof of this thing. The fact that he is so charismatic in everything he does, like if you want proof of how charismatic he is, like how he can get away with a promo this bad. Yeah. Like this nonsensical, and somehow you're just like, oh, that's homicide. Let the like, blood clot. Yeah, like it, it, the, he is so himself that like anyone else, you would feel like, oh, they're panicking. I just think that's homicide. Yeah, like, uh, <laughs> like it, it is. It is a crazy pro, and that's the end of the show. Well, actually, Sean Price then tells us, you know, he hypes the second anniversary show, which is the next show, and he says, you know, have a good night, but. Again, that's how the show ends basically with Homicide being like, I don't know when I'm coming back. If I'm coming back, I'm coming back. <laughs> See you later. Yeah. So <laughs> – <laughs> Well, 
first thing, well, he starts with, I'm never coming back. Then I don't know when I'm coming back. Then if I come back, then I'm coming back. See you soon. Yeah. And also in the promo, he uh, we've mentioned this, but like he never tells you why. No. Like, not once. No. Why he has to leave the company that's his heart and his strength forever doesn't even hint at it. It's just – it comes out of the blue. There's no re- explanation. And he just – and he won his match. Yeah. Cleanly. It's God. I do not know what was going on, but I'm very happy. <laughs> that, that was the last stand. That was our 34th Ring of Honor show that we've covered in our 34th episode. But when we get into uh, final thoughts, I'll start off with the Observer, who got a live report, and Dave wrote. Most accounts were, this was better than almost any indie show you'd see, but well below par for Ring of Honor. I would agree with the second half. I don't know. Yeah. This, there, there's probably some indie shows better than this, but... Um, I mean, there was, there was nothing bad. Like, I will say that. It's not like there were any stinker matches, at least not on the DVD. But I, I would say... There's nothing ba- really terrible on the show. Well, I really didn't like that three-way tag because of the way they handled it. But other than that, but I, I, th- I guess what I'm trying to say is no show since Wrath of the Racket has felt more like a B show. Like mm. clearly just this is a B-tier show. I would agree with that. And I think Rack of the Racket, Wrath of the Racket probably had – like higher high points, although like that, like I, th- I remember there was a match with Shelley and Jacobs against Cabana and A Steel that I liked a pretty good deal, but I feel like this match probably was slightly more entertaining, uh, p- partly because I thought the main event was pleasant and because I thought that the uh, the last promo was amazing. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it was a lousy show. I think overall, I think I think I'd, I feel comfortable saying that just like an uneventful drab show. The sh- the the product feels super stale. That's the crazy thing, and we were talking about this privately a day or two ago, but the the whole Feinstein scandal and the TNA guys getting pulled was a godsend because it forced them to freshen things up, and we were talking about what would have happened if that didn't happen because this company revisiting these shows was in desperate need of like a big shakeup. And yeah. I don't know if we would have gotten that without – the scandal and the talent polls and all of that. Right. Even with – I enjoyed the two shows prior to this, but like ROH did not feel like it had exciting stuff going on at this point. Um, so um, yeah, the, 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 un, the unfortunate events were at the very least well-timed for the creative direction of the company. And yeah, it, it's just – it, it the, it's there's nothing. It's an, another one of these shows where I, if you watch it, you won't hate yourself for watching it. But there's nothing here worth going out of your way for. And I think what leads the homicide to, promo, but we'll, yeah, okay, yeah, actually, we'll help you with that. Yeah, I'm gonna try and put that online. Although I, I wonder if it'll all fit in one clip on. But I'm gonna try and tweet that out when the show goes up, so you'll be able to check, and we'll plug our Twitter in a second. But I think the other thing that leaves a bit of of a sour taste in my mouth is just that. The last three matches were simultaneously the best matches on the show, but they were all matches I felt like could have been a bit better. Like it's it, so that's kind of a weird juxtaposition where it's like, well, these were all good, but I have on paper all these matches look like they should be really, really good, you know? Yes. And they're all just they're all good enough, but you know they can't all. Uh, but you know what? I love that we watch every show because that homicide promo is one of those examples where if, if we were picking and choosing, we probably would never review this show and we would miss out on one of the most amazing promos in the history of the show. Right, so, and if we and if we hadn't watched all of it, we'd probably think, oh, that promo must make sense, but we just haven't seen the stuff that makes it make sense. But nope, it doesn't make sense even if you've seen anything. <laughs> Everything, I should say. So that'll be the show. Um, if you want to contact contact us, as always, at Trevor Dame on Twitter or at Mayor MGF on Twitter, uh, through the years at gmail.com, T-H-R-O-H. We post on Pro Wrestling Only, Figure 4, Voices of Wrestling Boards in the plug sections. We have threads for if you want to prefer to do a message board type thing. And we will be back next time to cover the second anniversary show that includes um, – the the four way that's been the three way that's been built up here for a while except there'll be a four way with low key has the pure title one night tournament with a champ crown CM Punk and AJ Styles wrestle again and uh, 
yeah, it should be a big show in, in at least in it, it's a longer show than this one by a significant margin. Yes. Um, Matt, I don't know what else there is to say other than you're my heart. You're my strength. I don't know when we're going to do this again. I don't know if we're ever going to do another episode of the show. But when we do the show, we are definitely doing another episode. <laughs> and I can't wait. <laughs> I agree with everything you just said. Rock-a-bye, baby. Let's bounce. <laughs>